Hello and welcome to Who Books That with Harrison Greenbaum. I'm your host, Harrison Greenbaum, and thank you so much for tuning in. This show is every Wednesday at 7 p.m. if you're on the East Coast and every 4 p.m. Uh, on Wednesday if you're on the West Coast. There's a little banner. Uh, and this is, of course, presented and sponsored by the International Brotherhood of Magicians, who've been doing incredible work throughout the uh, quarantine pandemic time, as well as before and after. Uh, go to magician.org slash join dash the dash IBM slash join to become a member or to renew your membership. Uh, we just had a uh, transfer of the presidency from Alexander. So a huge thank you to Alexander. Uh, he had an incredible, uh, what a crazy time to be president of uh, of this wonderful magic organization. He did an incredible job and has been such a uh, an amazing supporter of, of this program um, and many other programs. So huge thanks to Alex and a huge congratulations to incoming president of the IBM, Stephen Bergazzi, who's been a guest on the show uh, as a regular guest, also as a surprise guest. Um, so uh, congrats and good luck to uh, to Stephen. Uh, our new president of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. And as always, this is available in podcast form on Apple Music or iTunes, depending on how up-to-date your software is. Just go to whobookstat.com for more info. You can click on the link. And uh, crazy enough, uh, if you leave reviews, uh, five-star reviews are great, and you download the podcast, it uh, goes on the, the rankings. And according to uh, the iTunes rankings, uh, this show is uh, top 30 in Japan. I didn't realize we had such a J Japanese contingency. Top 30 in Japan, top 50, I believe, in Germany. The, the last name of Greenbaum didn't scare him away, so that's good. And in the UK, US, and Canada is in the top 100 in performing arts podcasts. So thank you so much for making that happen. You can also follow me on social media at Harrison Comedy. That's on Twitter and on Instagram. I'm also on TikTok, but I'm an adult, so I'm not on it as much. Um, but Twitter and Instagram at Harrison Comedy. Now to our uh, our special guest. I'm so excited. Uh, not only is he an incredibly accomplished magician, uh, he had a show, a one-man show, Life and Other Deceptions, that was a huge hit, um, has toured, and is amazing. He is the showman uh, for The Illusionist. He has amazing releases in magic. His card to pocket is a seven DVD set. It's one of the most comprehensive things I've ever seen. I think it's over 22 hours on card to pocket. Definitely worth picking up. Uh, so in addition to being an accomplished magician, the winner of Close Up Magician of the Year, not just once, but twice, that's the maximum times you could win it. Uh, he is also an accomplished actor, screenwriter, director. He's been in over 250 hours worth of television and film. That is a lot. Uh, although in quarantine, I feel like I've watched that much. Um, but if you started watching Steve Valentine things in quarantine, you might have a few left to go still. I'm so excited to bring him up. He's coming to us from Canada. This is truly an international show. Make some noise, get excited from your home or apartment. It's Steve Valentine, everybody. Hello, <laughs> sir. That's the best introduction I've ever had in my entire life. That was amazing. Um, you got it all right. <laughs> How are you doing? You look great. How is your uh, quarantine been? It's all so lighting far? and makeup, mate. It's all it's good. What can I say? It's quarantine. It's um, it's actually been great time with the family. Uh, it's been all with the family. I have um, I have a lot of Russian in laws, so I've I've been up north in the mountains with them, kind of just hanging out in one house, which has been very Stephen King, especially yeah, yeah, on, you know, the you Russians, know. Uh, very well known for their sense of humor. <laughs> yes, you know, there's that line. Uh, what are you German? I think. What are you Russian? Kind of also. Kind of, <laughs> unless there's a, add a few vodkas, and then um, and then the sky's the limit. They're just very loud and very raucous and very funny. So yeah, you get both sides of the spectrum there. Yeah, well, if you, I don't know if they know any people, but if you want to talk to them and ask their uh, friends and relatives to uh, to to change the election in the other direction this time, <laughs> that would be really helpful. They're, 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 you know what? The Russians are, are big conspiracy theorists. You, uh, yeah, and it's never what you think. So uh, I, I learned a long time ago not to bring up that topic. Fair. Yeah. Well, we have a lot to get to because your your life and career is unbelievable. So unbelievable, in fact, it uh, is the basis of a one man show that is very good. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> let's start at the beginning. Um, you're born in uh, outside of London. Yes. Um, and you receive a magic set, uh, and I believe your siblings also receive some stuff uh, that was sort of prophetic. Yeah, true? my brother got a, my brother got a, my mum joined this catalog club and in order to join the catalog club, which was big back, back, back then, you know, back in the day, um, you had to <laughs> buy a couple of things. So she got my sister a chemistry set, my brother had some toy soldiers and she got me a little magic kit and it came with a hat and a little glue on moustache and white gloves and it had the whole thing. And um, your glue on moustache later, right now looks amazing, by the way. The what, sorry? Your glue on mustache looks impeccable tonight. Doesn't it? Doesn't it? Yes, I have a lot of experience with glue on mustaches. We can talk about those later if you want. Um, anyway, but years later, my uh, my sister is a scientist. 
my brother joined the army and then, you know, I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm out and about doing the entertainment and the magic and everything else. So it's a it very prophetic uh, moment. I reminded my mum about it just the other day and she, she didn't remember. And I was like, remember you <laughs> yeah, pretty crazy. I always find that amazing because like there are certain moments in your childhood that are burned into your memory and you yeah. just assume your parents also have a strong memory of it. And sometimes they don't even know that it happened. No, they're like, who are you? Oh, oh, oh right. Yes, that's, you're my son. Uh, it's so true. It's so true. But you remember the stuff from your perspective. Like, okay, that photograph, which one's me? I mean, that's my twin brother. Clearly you can't tell which one. They're the identical twins. No, you we're not. tell you two apart. <laughs> so my brother became a soldier and I began, look at those teeth. Look at those English teeth. First thing I got fixed when I came over here. I got a lot of comments about my teeth and I'm like, thank you, I bought them here. Um, America, you can't buy teeth like this in England. But yeah, yeah, real nice little. You see, the family was like, we're not gonna get you dental work because this is lucky. Having this gap is lucky, but it's not. It's just. <laughs> I mean, it definitely stands out. Here's a photo of you and uh, <laughs> let's make sure the people know where it is. There we go, yeah. Yeah, circle. That's, that's Butlins, that is Butlins 1985. That's, uh, yeah, that's me with a perm and a, Oh God, that's a holiday camp, you see, and uh, you're part of the entertainment team. It was a great experience. Got paid really bad money, and they I were heard. And I heard days. it's a very creative name. The people that perform at Butlins, what were they called? Redcoats. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I, I looking at this picture. I don't know where that name comes well, from. They should have called us white pants, but that would have been <laughs> unless you're an executive. If you're an executive. You get to wear the black tuxedo. You see, but the Butlins thing in England is the reason I did Butlins was because most of the big variety names have had spent some time in Butlins, and so it became kind of this rite of passage. This is um, I was a member of the Proscenium Theatre Company uh, from being a very young lad up until I was about seventeen, and so this was part of an old time music call number that we did. Yeah, that was a long time and ago. And Butlins was like a like a cat skills kind of thing, right? Yeah, totally. You got to do the bingo. You had to call the bingo, dance with the old ladies, um, it stay up all night. It was English, so you got to do the sing along. You know, then you did the variety shows. I did tap dancing. I had a magic spot. Uh, I was just it was great when you're a teenager and you're just you know you're getting drunk and having a good time and you know it's uh, it was a, it was a good rite of passage for me. Well, the next step from the cat skills of England is obviously. Yugoslavia, uh, that's the, <laughs> of the next step. <laughs> of course, it's the obvious, you know, there's that line in the Muppet movie where, it's, it's where I think, uh, one of the characters says, uh, not Gon Gonzo says, I'm gonna go to India to break into show business. And they're like, well, do you wanna go to Hollywood with us? And he's like, yeah, but if you wanna do it the easy way. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, um, I got a, I just got back from Butlins and broke up with a girlfriend. And I was like, I wanna get out, I wanna get out of the country like you do, you know as an emotional teenager. And this job came up looking for entertainers. And I remember going to London to uh, was the Strand, Ch Charing Cross Road, and I had a meeting in this little kind of tacky uh, uh, travel agent's office. And this guy's like, right, so here's the thing. You'll be in charge of a nightclub. You have to do 12 different acts. So there's two 20 minute spots a night. That's me, he says, you gotta do, um, uh, it doesn't matter what they are. And then you DJ until like two or three in the morning. And then you get one night off and then you start off again. One night off a week. So six nights a week, essentially, right? And uh, so you're just like a one man, at that point it was like being a one man red coat. So yeah, so I would do, I bought every trick I had and every trick I wanted to learn, I bought with me in a massive trunk. And then I put, um, I did everything from Yugoslavia, everything I learned from Butlin. So the, the Miss Lovely Legs competition, the beer drinking, I did a beer drink, <laughs> there it is. They built that for me. I don't know, beer, couldn't get away with that now, could you? <laughs> <laughs> At least it was legs. I think that's yeah. the saving grace. <laughs> All dudes, too. That was the amazing thing. Right. But um, we did, I did a beer drinking competition where I put the English against the Germans, against the French, um, and against the locals. If you can imagine that it was very fierce. It was, I was a very brave boy. Um, but it was, it was so much fun because I could try anything I wanted to try. And most of the time I'd fail, but it didn't matter. I was in Croatia, I, I, I was in Split, and at this place called Bashkovoda, a little, so if I failed, it didn't matter, you know? So I got a chance to go on stage and kind of find my voice as an entertainer and, and, try, and, and try and work out what that was. And then just try new tricks every night, go out there and just do stuff. Um, it, it, was, it was pretty great. Like I say, I, I remember this this one guy hands me a videotape 
at the end of um this is like 86 87 at the end of one show he's on vacation he's like here's a video and i'm like oh thank you very much he says yeah if we we filmed the show you, you should have it and i said oh no i said why don't you why don't you keep it as a souvenir and he, and he, he thrusts the video back in my hand and goes no no no, no you, you you keep it <laughs> <laughs> i'm like well it was that bad was it uh but you know and that was when i met um you don't you don't know who you who you meet right or, or who you affect as an entertainer at any point and i remember uh i got a tweet a couple of years back from jamie allen you know the illusionist from england yeah. who sent me this lovely message saying that he was a kid about eight years old and his dad had brought him to yugoslavia and he came every night to see the magic and apparently i was very nice to them and invited them backstage and showed them my big trunk of props and and it kind of inspired him to be a magician so that was very that was a very lovely moment. Also made me feel very old. I would like to put that. <laughs> yeah, that was brilliant. I, the only, I mean, the only reason I left was because the basically the war came, you know, and all what was fascinating, I should write about it one day, was all my friends in the village, because it was a small village, Bashka border, the, the factions started splitting up and people that had been friends now started arguing and, um, and we just kind of saw this dark cloud of war coming. Um, I basically just got out one night and they were just like, you really, we should take you to the airport, put you on a plane. And that's pretty much what happened. Yeah. And one of the things too, like in terms of like childhood magic, you, you start off as a magician, you're going yeah. to a magic club, right? Uh, I think it's South End by the Sea is that is the name of- uh... South End on Sea, yeah. South End Sorcerer's Society. The South End Sorcerer's Society. I'd, I'd comp- <laughs> I would never smile in a picture because of my teeth, you see. That was the problem. Um, South End, I-, I when That I was, explains I, that photo, but it doesn't really explain uh, this uh-oh. one. <laughs> 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 the, I can understand the not smile, but the teeth don't doesn't explain the makeup. Yeah, well, this is my, this is me doing a skull, macabre skull act, obviously inspired by McBride. I mean, clearly, you know, everybody was doing that kind of stuff. I could say that. Um, I put this kind of fire and skull act together uh, for an old time musical show. And then I would open, it was an opening act for these, I, it was completely wrong, but it went well. Uh, it was an opening act for like these old time variety artists. So people like Frankie Vaughan, who would come out and do like top hat and tap dancing in the second half. I always like the opening act. It made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Alvin Stardust. And there was this old um, uh, old singer from the 30, 40s called Ruby Murray. I mean, all these kind of classic acts. And then I was going and doing that. I, I There was so much fire and smoke. Um, I, I was hired to do the Alvin Stardust tour. Alvin Stardust was kind of like this English glam rock guy from the 70s. And and uh, when I met him, he was a lovely guy. But when he went out to do his set after I'd been on stage, he couldn't breathe because of all the smoke because the the I hadn't put enough lighter fuel on the rope. And so it was smoldering on stage. So he was pretty pissed. So I, I only did the one night, but there you go. And I don't want to. I don't want to uh, uh, skip ahead too much. But just to yeah. foreshadow, so you are opening up for these glam rock people. One of the roles that you get cast, uh, you've been cast more than once, is rock star. Is there yeah. are any of those rock stars that you opened up, uh, sort of inside of some of these characters? No, no. Um, they're based on people I've met uh, in LA. So I've met a lot of rock stars. You know, there's a lot of rock stars who are amateur magicians. They love magic and so um this character this is Derek Jupiter from I'm in the band he was more a, a blend between Steven Tyler and just just like a not so smart but very um very uh, arrogant uh, rocker he was a lot that was a lot of fun to play that part because you get to do you get to do you get to be a rock star without having to like train for the rock we had a guy come in who did the rock screams you know and um and then i got to wear this amazing wig and i used to get i used to get fan mail they'd say we love your hair and we love your voice and i'd be like thank you none of those are mine but it's very <laughs> nice. um, but i had so much fun doing doing that character doing that show it was all slapstick it was like three stooge slap, slapstick comedy the other one that you showed there was from psych um and that was the 100th episode which was i think the most fun i've ever had on a show ever i won't tell crossing jordan <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, as a guest star, as a guest star, as a guest star. Yeah, yeah. Because that was with that was with the almost the entire cast of of uh, Clue of the movie Clue. Amazing. And Curry, who wasn't well, um, and then and then me. So you know, like was it Christopher Lloyd? I'm, I'm like working and hanging out with Chris with Doc Brown, and just the, the whole thing was surreal. It was a lot of fun. And we're skipping ahead a little bit to your acting career, which we will get to for sure. But uh, I, I there was there is a tragic moment. Um, that it, where you so you're saying there's a lot of tragic moments in my career, but continue, yes. Um, but right after one of those magic meetings, you were 16, your dad passed away. Which uh, did did those magicians end up sort of coming surrogate father figures? Was that something that sort of happened? Yeah, they, they did. And there was, um, it was it was literally right after a South End Sorcerer's meeting. I we got back into the car, my dad picked me up, and we were driving home. And um, the weird part about it was, I kind of had this feeling. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, oh, what would happen if dad had a heart attack right now? You know, I just kind of wanted you because I didn't know how to drive and it was late and I think he'd had a couple of beers. So I was like, what would happen? If... And um, and then we get home and he pokes his head in the living room. I was going to stay up and read some magic and he pokes his head in the living room. He's like, I'm, are you going up? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm going to stay up. He's like, all right, bye. He always said bye. He never said good night. And, um, and that was it. And then he had a heart attack and they took him to the hospital. And uh, the last next time I saw him, he wasn't, uh, he was dead. So it was pretty brutal. And these guys were great, South and Sorcerer Society. I mean, they meant a lot to me as a kid growing up. I joined the club when I was 10. It's an adults only club, but they they made an exception for me. <laughs> and um, uh, they, when I decided to move to America, they, uh, I, I had to sell everything I had, all my magic, you know, um, and to, to make up and get enough money. And they bought, almost everything. I mean, books, the tricks they already had, tricks that didn't work anymore. Um, uh, Harry Barron, who's this kind of classic name in, in magic. If, he had a magic shop called Kmar Magic. Kmar Magic is still alive, you know? And Harry bought a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, I remember his wife was just always hammering at him, you know, and she was just like, why are you buying this stuff? You already have it. And he's like, I'm helping the boy out. And then he printed um, these booklets for me Harry would all um, that I could sell while I was working on how to cheat at cards. He had these booklets made up, and you could you could buy them from him, and he would put your name as the author, right? And so he printed up a whole. He was lovely. I mean, everybody was so lovely. Um, and then this character Dick Turpin, who was this old street performer character. If you read about the history of magic, you'll read about these two guys, ha um, Harold Spencer and uh, Dick Turpin, and they were kind of these these two itinerant street performers who would often go into a pub. One one would be the magician, the other would just be a punter. And they, <laughs> would, they used to make a lot of money. So uh, Howard, Howard Spencer. Um, just discovered the other day, I was reading an old magic magazine, I discovered Howard Spencer died riding his bicycle home um, across a bridge in London and went into the Thames. These are interesting things that you don't know about. <laughs> or need to know about, but it was fascinating. But no, Dick was, I said bye to Dick Turpin. And um, yeah, we jumped on a plane and just went to America. It's pretty crazy. And actually somebody asked, and if you are watching, uh, a lot of people are watching live right now, uh, we do get to see all the comments. So any questions that you have, keep those coming in. There'll be time yeah. to end the show to go through as many as we can. But yeah. uh, Kristen Chittenden said, Steve, were you ever nervous when moving from England to the USA? No, because I, I only had like two thousand dollars in your pocket or something, right? Yeah, I didn't. I only had a, uh, maybe at the most, maybe a grand. I think. Um, you know what? Youth comes with a certain naivety that I think is there on purpose because you, you're never going to leave the house or try anything if you don't believe that you can jump out of the nest and fly. And for me, it was just the next logical step. I had magic. I always thought I could make a living doing magic while I was pursuing. The acting career and that was that was the goal and we went to LA and and because that's where it happens basically a friend of mine Sue Devaney who's a British act really well-known British actress had said to me oh you know we should go knock on doors and and in America and knock on some agents doors and show them some British actors you know <laughs> and she said you should do that you can do that you don't you don't have any ties you, you basically you've got nothing going on for you <laughs> I was like, thanks um and uh, but it put the little seed in my in my head so it's what we ended up doing and um years later this is so weird when i did the one man show life and other deceptions which is that it's about it's a combination of magic and stories so it's, it is that journey of coming to la the whole show is about that and being an actor and a magician and 
find, finding they don't really work well together if you want to be an actor. It's difficult to be a magician. Um, I was putting the show on and I got a Facebook message from Sue that she was in LA, hadn't seen or spoken to her in 30 years or so, and uh, maybe 25 years. And she came and saw the show and I quote her in the show. So it was kind of a very strange, all like very weird life moment. And also there was a weird thing because as soon as you got to LA, a British couple kind of took you guys in, right? Yeah, there was a, well, there, you know, when you go, when you just jump in, and you just go for it, which is my mantra. Like for me, there's like you, you, you can. I was saying this the other night. You can, you can work on something until it's perfect, and then you're never going to get to do it. Right. Or you can just jump in and learn as you go. I, re I really believe, except, unless you're a doctor, in which case, get it perfect. Exactly. <laughs> Please practice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's the second time you've done it. Lovely. Uh, but I, I think, I, I believe in learning on the job. I think that. Up a point, I think that's 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 it. So um, we arrived in LA. I, I had I see my wife and I, I had no money. I, we had a little bit of money. I had no job. Didn't know anyone. And and I remember we stopped at the first apartment complex we stopped at was run by an English couple. And they said, uh, "Are you?" Um, uh, I remember they were like, "Do you have any credit?" And I was like, "I had no idea what credit was really." And, <laughs> and, and I didn't have a job. But they said, because I was from English from the old country, they were going to give me a break and let me rent without a credit check, without anything, as long as I promised to get a job. And then the lady who worked there, um, uh, who was the manager, the wife of the manager, she said, oh, you know what? David or Gell's in, Be she's, she worked at Giorgio's in Beverly Hills on Rodeo Drive. And she said, David or Gell's, which is an antique silver place there, was looking for a, a salesman. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I'll sell, I'll sell anything. I can sell silver, yeah, antique silver. And so, so she set up an appointment and I got a job there. Talk about lucky. Um, so I immediately got a job. And then, so this guy, Norris, he says to me, so what, you know, what, what's your plans? And I was like, well, I'm going to break into acting, you know? And, and of course he was like, oh dear, oh dear. Um, and he said, how are you going to pay for that? And I was like, by being a magician. <laughs> and I, and he, I said, there's a place called the Magic Castle somewhere. I was like, if I can, I talk about this in the show, but he goes, I said, if I can find it, I know it's in LA somewhere. If I can find it, maybe I can get, get some work there, get my foot in the door. And <laughs> um, and he pulled me out onto the street and he goes, he says, this is 1737 North Orange Drive. That building right there is the Magic Castle. And it was just this strange, bizarre, again, my life has been full of those moments of, of like, are you taking the piss? You know, like when you just look <laughs> at the sky and go, are you screwing with me? Like, this is so weird. Castle, I remember I walked up, to uh to find out how to join I, the, billy mccomb was in the front uh the front desk uh, chatting up the girls oh yeah there he is uncle billy and billy just is i said oh you're billy mccomb i read about i read all your articles in magigram and he was like oh dear boy just come on in let me show you around and he signed my my membership certificate so it was pretty amazing you know and that also of all the people to give you a tour of the castle on their first day, Billy McComb, that's pretty epic. Can you imagine as like, that was pretty, that was like was stars in my eyes. Yeah. Billy working pro read all his books, had all his books, did all of his material <laughs> <laughs> at the time back in Yugoslavia when no one could see me. Um, and uh, yeah, no, that was amazing. I love Billy. I, miss I remember the first time I ever did the castle, they put me up in the Nirvana and I was in the Billy McComb suite and they put a giant picture of his face over the bed. And I was like, I guess that's a subtle uh, a suggestion not to have any hanky-panky in this room. Yeah, right, just when you're thinking it, you're feeling it, and yet, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> he's, uh, yeah he's, he's actually, uh, uh, the best contraception, I think, is Billy McCombs' face. <laughs> it's fantastic. Billy McComb, a new contraception. That's right. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's talk about, because we're now, we're now you're in Hollywood. Um, I have an early headshot. Um, let's see if I can. Do. I, I think do. this one needs an explanation. Um, Does it though? I think it's all there. <laughs> I, I don't think you need my. So my mate Chris Amoroso is an amazing photographer, and he he did a whole bunch of shots. This was um, early two thousands, and I had these amazing these like crazy ass boots. And then <laughs> he came over to the house, and that chair was in my living room. Long story. Um, and uh, yeah, we were just going for a slightly more, you know, trendy. That, believe it or not, that was actually hip at the, or maybe not. Maybe it was never hip. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, I like that shot actually. It didn't get me any work, but it's a great shot. 
<laughs> well, I've noticed I, you, you've done, uh, going through your IMDb is insanely impressive because there's just so many things you've done. I've done my best to try to categorize it into, I feel like you fall into certain categories. There's, uh, there's obviously Crossing Jordan when you were a series regular on a yeah. network show. That's a pretty big break. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then I've also found you have, uh, there's monster slash villain. Yeah. That happens a bunch. There's a whole bunch. Of, yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, that's I th almost, I think the devil. That, yeah, that's a that's um, a Jack in the Box commercial that I did that uh, was a lot of fun. Where, uh, yeah, I don't remember what happened on there. I only aired a couple of times for some reason. I did a whole bunch of commercials. I was doing a ton of commercials right before Crossing Jordan came along, and um, it was one of those moments where I had like five national commercials running. I was the cheese. I was a chef in this cheese spot. And I did like two of those, and I forget what else. I was doing a lot of characters at the time. And, um, I discover I did these discover card commercials where we were art, we were art critics and so we got to do one with Ringo Starr and all these kind of like this, this great um, and then this this recurring role came up for this series called Crossing Jordan and uh, I told my agent I'd started doing under fives managed to get my foot in the door and I was doing these small roles and I started doing a ton of guest star stuff and I'd said to my agent I only want to do recurring and series regulars because you've just got to keep pushing your career you can't stay where you are. You always have, to, and sometimes to to um, make that change, you have to be willing to take a loss, right? So I was like, we're turning down the smaller jobs. We're only so this came up for recurring. And did magic give you that confidence? Or did you? Because I feel like it's one thing to say no to a role and no and have no fallback and nothing, but to you kind of no, always magic in your back pocket. No, I was doing a lot of commercials, so I felt like I was kind of in the wave of, there was a lot of character -y commercials that were being made back then in the mid nineties. And so I felt like late, mid to late nineties, but I was, I was okay. I had magic. So, I mean, I could, I was doing a lot of the Beverly Hills party circuit, close up stuff, big clients. And that was great. You know, um, it was good and it wasn't, didn't help me as an actor, which was the bit, which I discovered. But, um, but I remember thinking, all right, yeah, I'll go do, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll, I'll audition. And I got the part and um, I remember it just got cut in the pilot. It just got cut down to like three lines. And I was like, oh, well, that's it. You know, and I remember thinking this character could be English. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't have to be American because it's set in Boston, a lot of Irish and British in Boston. And it would be really nice to play an English character on American TV that isn't a cliche, right? It isn't just kind of like I say, isn't there for the punchline, you know, like I say tea or whatever. <laughs> tea, Sorry, I'm sweating a bit. And um, so it was it was, but then when they came back, uh, this is one of those one of those shudder moments. You know, I remember I was offered another episode and uh, for less money than the pilot, <laughs> and I just I was like, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but looking back now, like I shudder to think what I was thinking. But I was like, no, I, I, I you know, a lot of it's about knowing your value or or perceived value, <laughs> um, <laughs> just in yourself. So because I know that. If, and since then, every time I've accepted a job, I've always been like, I've accepted it now, so whatever happens, can't bitch about it, right? If you accept the job, you've accepted the job, right? If you're going to do a gig for 200 bucks, don't be bitching about it or treat it that you accepted the job. So um, so I was like, no. And then they, my agent thought I was crazy. And then they came back with more money. And then I went and did it. And then two or three episodes in, uh, it was clear that the character was working. And I remember having a conversation with my agent, like, I think this should be a series regular, you know, he's like in every episode. And then they called and offered me the series regular. And that, that was an amazing, it was the best way to do it because you, it's very hard to get a job as a series regular in a show because you, what you normally test, you normally have to go into a room with 20 other actors, all going for the same role. You've already done your contracts. You've already, you can see the money you're gonna make. You can see how it's gonna change your life. Hello, Marcy, Marcy was there the whole time. Um, and uh, what did Marcy say? What did, what did Marcy you say? said, you were an awesome magician as well as an awesome actor. Love my years working as the receptionist on Crossing Jordan with you. You were always so nice and so kind to our background group. We all thought the world of you, Missy oh, Marcy. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah, we, 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 we were an awesome set. I mean, we were, everybody was tight. There wasn't, there wasn't that kind of like, uh, you know, them and us kind of attitude. And whenever we got a guest star on, we were always very welcoming and to the guests. It was just a very, really great atmosphere. And the, the creator of the show, Tim Kring, uh, who also did um, Heroes and a bunch of other stuff. You know, Tim, he's a lovely guy. And I think that 
trickles down from above. And when you have great people who are your bosses, I, I think that trickles down. You feel relaxed and you feel like there's a, there's a love to the set. Um, yeah. I forgot what I was saying before that, but. Oh no, one of the things, one of the, the trivia aspects of Crossing Jordan was that I believe they tried to build in a backstory that your character, Nigel, had a hobby in magic and you resisted. Uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, yeah. So, okay, so here's what happened, right? So I had uh, dinner with um, uh, Ray Stark, who was his movie producer. And Ray uh, said to me, I met him at the castle, and he's like, I want to talk to you about a movie. Because whenever I got introduced in the close-up room, I'd always be like, he's an actor, he's a da 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 da. So, I mean, I was trying to break in. I remember doing um, doing a gig for a really big uh, um, Hollywood director. It'll come to me in a minute. And and uh, and the gig went amazing. And I was at his house, and he brought, called me back a second time. And then I'm, oh, this is great. So I send him a basket saying thanks for the fruit basket, saying thanks for the work. And I put my my reel in the basket. <laughs> <laughs> and I, By the way, I'm also an actor, which I think could be the title of my biography. Um, and <laughs> actually that should that should be the next show. But um, so I send him this and I never heard from him ever again. <laughs> it was devastating. So anyway, it was a Ray Stark invites me to his house for dinner to talk about a movie. And we go, I have to sit through this entire evening. There's all these other people there. We, we sit and we watch American Pie. He gets a first run from the, it was very strange. Didn't quite understand the pie scene. Um, and we watch, and at the end, everyone goes home and it's just us and, uh, and me, me and him and he hands me a script and it's Houdini and he's, and he's talking to Tom Cruise to play Houdini, I believe. And I'm like, this is great. I'm like, what role can I play? You know, and he's like, no, no, I want you to help me with the magic. And I was like, well, that's great. I'll do that for free. I'll be a magic consultant for free. But like, there has to be something, even if it's like five lines to help me get my foot in the door. And he was like, what are you, a magician or an actor? Got to make a choice. You know, he was really very definitive about that. And I saw, I could see the, this balance wasn't, it worked in England, you can act and you can do magic, you can do variety, a game show and then do Shakespeare, it doesn't matter. But in America it was very pigeonholy. So in the end, um, I, 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 I quit the magic. And when I quit the magic, that was it. I was never a magician. I was terrified because I, what I found was that when people saw me as a magician, they didn't think take me seriously as an actor. So I'm on set. And as far as I'm concerned, no one knows I do magic. And somebody, one of the producers came up to me and they were like, you did uh, Ari Bernstein's, uh, um, Ari Bernstein's uh, Christmas party like uh, uh, like three years ago. And I was like, it wasn't me. Right? <laughs> no, 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 Steve Valentine. I said, no, it wasn't me. Comes in next day with my business card. <laughs> my name on it. Yeah, Steve Valentine, sparkling hocus pocus, little English flags in the corner. And I was like, no. Wasn't me. That's this other guy, Steve Valentine. Looks like me, sounds like me, same name, not me. Don't do magic, right? And um, so then they write it into the show. They're like, this would be a great talent for, for Nigel to have. And I, di I didn't want to do it. I, I, and, I, and I was so, and now looking back, you know, it's, you got to understand the scars that were there at the time. Now I don't care. Now I think of everything. Uh, but, um, I, I was deliberately bad with the card trick so that we didn't ever have to do it again. It was, that was part of a 10 year break, right? There was like a 10 year uh, sort of hiatus from magic where it was only acting. Yeah. Just acting. Um, and, and I just started kind of picking up as a hobby again. And I did a movie for uh, Disney and when I was in New Zealand called Avalon high and that's the night for the stuff. And um, yeah, and I bumped into a guy from the South End Sorcerer Society. <laughs> and I was like, I know you. I remember you from when I was a kid. He had no idea who I was. Anyway, so we meet and uh, we have dinner and he has video of all the guys from South End from when I was a kid, including Dick Turpin, who was my mentor. And it just kind of sent me back on this journey, like full on. Like that, I'm like, oh, I can go back into magic now as I've been gone for so long. And it was crazy. I don't know if you find this, but the subconscious never stops, you know? And suddenly I'm back in, I'm like, what was my act? Oh, what was the problem with this thing? And suddenly I'm coming up with all these solutions and new, new material and just kind of, um, yeah, it's pretty great. It's pretty great. But it's the, but the acting, you know, you quit magic to do acting and then the acting bring, brought me back in many ways to, to it, so. Yeah, I, I mean, I find it so fascinating because for, for me, my split is between magic and one side 
and stand-up comedy. And for years, I was terrified of any of the stand-up comedians finding out I did magic of any kind. So I kept them yeah. very separate. The worlds were, uh, I, I did, it was, I, the joke that I make is it's like being a preschool teacher who also does burlesque. I didn't want any of my, uh, the other teachers to find out I had pasties hidden right. in the bag in the closet. You know, and, and I should, you should, we should explain that it's not about hating magic. It, right. It's not about not loving magic. It's, it's about having to pursue something. And sometimes you have to make that, you have to make that Sophie's choice between what you, you know, where you're going to go, because it's just, you, you've got to work your way through the landscape. I, you doing comedy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, it, it, I equate it to if somebody says I'm a mime actor or I'm a plumber actor, you know, <laughs> It's, you know, it, you know, do you think people take them seriously? Unfortunately, they don't in this business. So it's just about surviving. But I recently, because as I was saying, there were some like archetypes. There was a, a bunch of villain monster roles. There's the vaguely evil, scary role. I was, uh, I was hosting a game show that I had to go at hosting a game show. That was uh, a state of panic. That was fun. We shot that, we shot that in, you, in, um, in Argentina in 2008. And, um, and I remember it was, there's only did, we only did one season and I, uh, on sci-fi, but there were so many near accidents <laughs> that I was like, I don't want to be hosting a show where someone's going to die. Right. And, so even um, if it's in Argentina where life evidently is cheap. Well, it was shot in Argentina, but they bought the competitors in from the States. So um, the idea is brilliant ideas. You have one set and then you sell the show to all these other countries and they can come shoot on that set too, right? So they, they do a lot of game shows that way. But there were just so many shortcuts at the time. And I remember saying to, I had a meeting with the head of sci-fi at one point and then he was like, so what do you think about another season? I'm like, well, if we can make it safer. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. And I think that was the wrong thing to say. But I just didn't want to be that guy who's that someone, done, you know, it was very, ah. very near the edge, that show. And you can see it if you if you watch it. It's uh, that said, I had a great time filming it. <laughs> and somebody actually wrote in Derek Jupiter was my favorite character when I was 13. I'm 24 now, and he's still my favorite rock star. I love you, Steve. I send you a hug from Argentina. Argentina! Oh, I love it. Full circle. When is Iris? I, when I landed in, thank you very much for that, by the way. But when I, when I landed in Argentina, there was a, a protest going on in the streets. And so I was suddenly dropped just on a side street with my suitcases. And they were like, your hotel is three blocks that way on the other side of the procession, you know? And so now I'm like going in the atmosphere, the drums are going and the atmosphere, <laughs> and people are protesting the government and it's, and they're marching and there's banners. And I'm like, welcome to, welcome to Argentina. And I'm like, excuse me, excuse me, pardon me. And I'm like, kind of like <laughs> with, the, with these two suitcases. Uh, Buenos Aires, beautiful, love Argentina. Had a great time there. And we're, we're about to get into the surprise guests. Um, uh, there are more than one. That's the first surprise. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about is because you have played a magician in a lot of different shows. Um, yeah. There you, uh, this is on Just Shoot Me with Pamela Anderson. There yeah. is you being a magician with Monk. Yeah. Um, that's doing magic on a date. And then that was Anger Management, the Charlie Scene show. That, that was, and what, what the hell is that? That is the great, uh, that is Beardini from oh, Beardini. Uh, the Disney yes. series. Even though uh, anybody could technically play a magician if they're animating them, uh, they chose an authentic magic voice. You know, this is what I mean about getting typecast with magic. Is I, I used to get casting directors that would say to me, if a role comes up for a magician, we'll let you know. And I would be like, no, no, it's I can do other parts. In animation, I, I get called all the time to do the voices for magicians. <laughs> I just has my sleight of hand. How is that? Do you know what's going right, on? Exactly. I mean, I'm happy for the work. Don't get me wrong, but it's just it's um, it's kind of funny how that works. That was a lot of fun. The great Biadini. And he looks like you a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. It's There's nothing like having your voice, having being the the animated voice to a character, the, the voice to an animated character. I, I love seeing that come to life. But now that I've got two little kids and they see it, uh, and I did I did a whole bunch of stuff for Mickey and the Roadster Racers. As as the villain commander heist, it's, it's kind of it's a very kind of strange voice, and uh, the kids watch it all the time and they're laughing. Just, does that freak them out? Or are they like, why is dad coming? Why is why does commander sound like my dad? My daughter gets it. My son, who's four, only recently kind of got it over quarantine. I think he's just starting to understand. Oh, you're an actor. Okay, I get it now. You know, he's beginning <laughs> to understand. They're watching the Disney stuff now, so they're beginning to see. Uh, you know, my son's like, why are you always so mean to people? I'm like, oh, what's 
as long as I'm not mean to you, son. You know, that's the. Wait till he starts playing video games. He's going to have a lot to catch up on. Oh, I don't want to. Yes, that's. Uh, I try and avoid that. I mean, I love video games, but he's four, right? So yeah. give him at least another six months. Uh, well, we're going to try something. This is the first time we've ever tried this on Who Books That. We always have surprise guests. Uh, and usually uh, we, we kind of, I kind of like subtly lead the guests to talk about that person and then spring them upon them. But this time I'm going to have you guess the guest. So okay. I'm going to bring uh, him or her on screen right now. Your first surprise guest. Uh, he or she is underneath that. Uh, that is that somebody in the name. kitchen? <laughs> so people so, in the kitchen. Uh, someone in the kitchen. Mystery guest, if you can give us your first clue as to who you might be. Ooh. Well, an absolute pleasure to see you again. I just... Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that gives you any kind of hint. No. Who is it? Take it. Who is it? I, I, I have such a bad signal here. Who, I, I take it. I've no idea. Give me another clue. Mystery guest, do you have a clue? Go to the channel. Yeah. Oh. Oh. There's a second reveal. Now you see a little bit more of the mystery guest. Does that uh, help you? Is a hood? Oh, is that Billy? I don't know. I was just talking to Billy Kid the other day about doing a blindfold thing, and she was talking about a hoodie blindfold. Is that Billy Kid? Oh, that's a good clue. Um, I don't know if that's the right answer, but that is. I think you're going in the right direction. <laughs> I don't know who it is. All right, let's reveal it. Is it Billy Kid? No, it's not. Who is it? Hey, hi. Hi. <laughs> Ages, can't you remember? We worked at Butlins. We oh. were back in uh, Bogner, Minehead. I started in Pathwally in 1981. Scarborough. And was, were you at Scarborough? Yes. Oh, the Grand Hotel Scarborough. Lindsay, I was uh, I was in Scarborough for about four months. <sighs> We really reached deep back. You know, you know, a lot of legwork to find this person. You just start in magic, and uh, you, you, yeah. can, uh, can you remember? And they just show me some magic tricks, and they're just every night pulling me in, pulling me in. Well, you know, it's what we do as magicians. We pester the people who look vaguely interested until uh, until we alienate them, and then uh, you know, and then we just move on to the next uh, victim. That's yeah, good. Where are you now? In the in the kitchen. Was there is there anybody else in there? I, I saw some people in the I saw a person walk by. Yeah, who was that who walked uh, by? Oh, that was George. Did you do you not remember George either? I, I don't, I don't. <laughs> but this that doesn't mean anything. The eighties were very good to me. This is the um, first time George uh, was from Kettering. Right, okay. Your mum lives there. My mum is now in Norfolk. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. My mum is now in Norfolk. She's everywhere. She's 80 and cold. Uh, yeah, is there a mystery guest? Is there anybody else uh, in, in that apartment that we could talk to as well? Only George at the moment. George is here. Actually, all right. Okay, Steve, I'll show you the first trick. That you, I've been practicing this for so many years. This is the first trick that you ever showed me. Oh my God, are we going to do it? Okay, uh, all right. With bicycle cards too. That was a, that's impressive. Hey! Oh, you little <laughs> monkey. See, now that's... <laughs> I quit. <laughs> the whole time I'm like, I don't know this person. Who is this? I know. <laughs> you were very admirable, though. I got to say, you really faked it pretty well. It is clear that you are a professional actor. <laughs> Could you tell my eyes? I'm just like, I was about to, I was about to, <laughs> I was about to keyboard you like, freaky fan, I don't know who this is. <laughs> and, and George, that was great. First of all, Billy, it's good to see you're quarantining. That's fantastic. Good for you. And, uh, <laughs> Distant. They're in my bubble. They're from the pub down the way, where uh, <laughs> um, everything happens. We rehearsed this. We had blocking. Oh my god! Everything. Who played the role of Lindsay? Lindsay. Oh, hi, Lindsay. 
I'll bring her. I'll bring her in. That was a beautiful performance. Well done. Congratulations. <laughs> oh my god. It was the uh, the Butlins thing where it was like, oh was it was it Scarborough? Was it Scarborough? <laughs> 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 but you were fooled, right? Do you know, yes, bit. but do you know that happens people come up to me all the time and they're like, Oh, hi, remember me? And I'm like, No, I'm sorry. I don't we met 13 years ago on a cruise ship. I'm like, no. <laughs> Sorry. I know. Thanks, but, Steve. Thanks. No, but really, I love your work. <laughs> uh, and by the way, I have a photograph. This looks tampered with, but I'm assured this is very real. Uh, oh, this yeah, photograph of you at the Magic Castle. Yeah, no, that's tampered with. <laughs> that is, yeah. Real. Billy, no. can you tell us the uh, story behind this photo? I, well, Billy, why don't you tell, I mean, that is, uh, is that a cardboard cutout or you just started like putting my picture everywhere for fun? I forget what it was. No, that's a, that is a cardboard cutout. That was another time that I fooled you, if you remember, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> we, so basically, um, in that photo is our rich friends, Dino and Dan Goldberg, and yep. we were at the castle, he was not there. I and wasn't for there. Some and by reason, the way, the lighting, uh, the lighting person behind uh, Steve's One Man Show. Yes, yes. Who so Dan, um, Dan was my stage manager and he did, yeah, I would, couldn't have done the show without Dan. He was amazing. Yeah. So we had the idea of just uh, pretending, <laughs> I don't even know how this started. We're like, let's pretend there's a cardboard cutout of Steve in the lobby of the castle, the one place where you're allowed to take a photo. And so we just mimed it for who could get the height right, which was difficult. And then photoshopped that and sent it to Steve, pretending that like, oh my gosh. I think I'm the new Flat Albert. You know the flat character you <laughs> take him everywhere you go in the world. Where's Steve? That I should just sell those. You know. Little. But you did believe that trick too for for a while, didn't you? You were um, like, what? Why is there a cardboard cut? I was like, I don't know. They just. Yeah, I believe I believe there was a life size cardboard cutout only because I own a life. Of course, I own a life size <laughs> cardboard cutout of my character Derek Jupiter who had you know the rock star who had a lot of them in his apartment and um and so i managed to when we when the show closed i was like i'll take those thank you very much so. i give the audience a little taste of it. <laughs> yeah that's the, that knee slide is you've nothing makes you feel more like a rock star than you have to put on these knee pads these um rock rock hard knee pads but doing a rock slide with a mic just in the wind machine and the, oh, you just, you feel like a rock star. It's the best feeling in the world. And can you do the hair wave as well? <laughs> and my, and I, I have a mate, Chuck Wright, um, who's, who was in, um, uh, was quite right. And he showed this move, the mic stand, where you, you hold the mic stand and you spin it like this. And the you and it spins in your hand. It looks like a propeller. And you go like that. And that was that was my that was my to move for Derek was just spinning that microphone. And then I tried once the thing where it goes out and then you step on and it comes back, but that whacked me really hard in the nose, and I never did that again. So I once chipped my tooth doing stand up, and I that, I, I I remember coming off stage. And I said, "Are you okay?" And I said, "Due to the dental work, I think I'm that show cost me about uh, a few hundred dollars." <laughs> Was it the thing where you try to pull the mic out? And you go, yeah, like, it's right in my face. Was it that? Was it that? <laughs> yep. Chip this dude right here. Yeah. Oh um, my God. There's one. I remember going on stage once and going, hello. And then this big green bit of phlegm came flying out of my mouth <laughs> in the spotlight into the audience. And it was, uh, yeah, it was disgusting. <laughs> Hi, Susan. How are you? Me. What? Did somebody Maybe. catch your big piece of phlegm? Yeah, they asked me to sign it and it was, it got weird. And Billy, I know you also do acting as well. Um, can Ooh. you tell us a little bit about your, because I think you guys have sort of opposite paths where uh, you were shifting from magic to acting, you were going from acting to magic, um, and you guys sort of ran in, in reverse course. Yeah, well, I wouldn't say do acting anymore. No, I've quit cold turkey going <laughs> on maybe tw almost 12 years now. Um, I won't even watch Hamilton. I made a vow. Uh, what? Watch. How can you not watch? Hi, Erica. Hi, Erica. You 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 have to watch Hamilton. Hamilton's amazing. I um, someone else today was telling me the same. I was like, I've made a promise. I'm. It's cool. You went the other way. You decided acting and magic, and then you went the magic route, right? And then I went uh, the acting route. But now, if I can do both, you can do both. Nothing wrong with that. Mm. 
<laughs> She's like, don't bring it up. <laughs> well, has he really influenced your work in any way? Has, has, has working with him and hanging out with him uh, had an effect on your show? Um, yes, I guess in a, in a storytelling kind of way, because there's few, there's few one man shows slash magic shows. I mean, okay, here's, here's the thing. When I saw Steve's one man show, Life and Other Deceptions in LA, I thought I was seeing a magic show. <laughs> and, then, and then I was like, oh my God, what is this? This isn't right. This is going against my promise of never seeing theater again. Oh shit, <laughs> I, corner. I didn't know what to do. And then it got worse because then there was like a Q and A after, which I didn't know was happening, so I couldn't actually leave it. Um, <laughs> experience because I made that promise. But um, yeah, it 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 I guess it has been influential uh, because there's few magic shows in general that I've seen where I can walk away and remember them for good reasons. <laughs> Very few, and I would probably like. say that his show is one of one of like two or three that I've seen. So that's always a good thing. So is that. You, uh, is you became a, a, a recurrent screamer. Is that true? I'm so, what? Well, <laughs> I, I think that's, I, that's uh, to the rat. The rat bit in your show. Yes. I don't know. If you <laughs> in my show, I see what you did there. <laughs> what happened? So, do you remember? I remember this. It was like slow motion. It was like a movie. You and Dan Goldberg were getting yeah. the show ready. I was in the audience trying not to touch any, touch another man's props. I was right. trying to be like, Never touch another cool. man's props, yes. And Dan goes to you and he goes, he goes, who are we gonna get to do the scream in the show? And then you're like, I don't know. And then you both did, as if choreographed, you both <laughs> always turned your head to me like this. And I was like, oh my God, um, because screaming is not in my vocabulary, anything like, like, um, yeah, it's, you know, all I wanted, all, this is all I needed was for someone to stand up. Uh, how hard is this, Harrison? At one point, um, there's a rat that uh, apparently this rat has flown out of the cage. The cage vanishes. The rat's in the audience somewhere. Don't worry. He's super friendly. Suddenly, somebody's supposed to just jump up and start screaming, and it leads into another bit. And then we go, and scene, thank you, wonderful performance. See you at the after party. That's the bit, right? Uh, now, Dan couldn't do it. Dan's from Canada. He's so nice. He can't scream. He, <laughs> he's like, ah. I'm like, Dan, that's. So I thought, Billy, you could do it. No. <laughs> I did it, but you didn't I don't know. remember it. That so, I don't, that, that's just not, it's just not in, there's no reason to scream ever in life. I got you to perform uh, in, a, in a theater play. There you go, so. Yes, you did. All right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm still coming down from the um, from the uh, uh, interview with the person I didn't know. That <laughs> well, we actually have a couple more surprise guests. Oh, great! Together. Do I know these people too? I, I think you do. I hope you do, uh, Billy. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, I love your magic. I love you. You're so great. And uh, thank, you. thank you for staying up late for us. And you're coming to us from London. What time is it there? I'm just waking up. I got my beer. I'm ready to go. <laughs> uh, thank you Don't so worry. much. And uh, hopefully, I get to see you again soon. Mwah. See ya. Bye. Well, bye. 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 Really good, everybody. Uh, by the way, Steve, uh, we, we yes. have touched upon this, uh, and people have been asking tons of questions about this. Erica okay. Larson called you a silver fox. I well, agree with that. Right. You know, I've got my COVID no dye thing going on right now, right? So I didn't do the hair. It's funny when you put that photograph of me from the show up, and I'm all dark with the beard and everything. I'm like, <laughs> oh, it's going to be a bit of a contrast, you know? Um, yeah. No, I just decided to go uh, see what see what it looks like. I thought I might be a little gray. And then we had an accident at the barber's last week where just the guy just went right in with the <laughs> thing. So, it's, so I'm like, all right, well, I've always wanted to do the, you know, the little bit on top with the short back and sides. And apparently I'm really silver. So there you go. <laughs> no, it looks good. It's a new uh, me. There have been people who have been asking questions the entire, uh, this entire show about your one man show, Life uh, and Other Deceptions. Yeah. Uh, a fantastic show. Um, let me, I have the poster art, which is really great. Um, let me pull that up somewhere and get buried in here. But uh, you yeah. didn't work on this in a vacuum. There were, uh, somebody directed it, uh, somebody- So we had uh, like Chris Philpot and uh, was integral to the show and um, an incredibly creative writer and creator. Yeah, that's that's the artwork there. And um, Chipper Lowell uh, directed. Uh, I'd sent the script to Chipper for some notes and and he was just, he offered to direct it. And I was I never even thought that would be amazing. and. You know, Chipper's experience in doing, I'd never done anything like this before. 
like doing a one man show you you that's talk about diving in with without thinking i mean honestly it's you write it i wrote the script which was like three hours long and then we had to put it on its feet so we had to cut and edit and then i had to learn it and when you write stuff for yourself the hardest thing is finding your voice you know it's that, especially in a way where you have to talk to the audience and tell them a story without it all being like me 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 which is which is what a one man show is it's like the last refuge of the narcissistic actor right <laughs> it's just all about me and it is and that's the nature of it and and i watched a ton of one man shows and live performances and uh and chipper was just able to cut through to the bone directing and we we were directing late at night because we could only get the theater super late uh i said to my friend E.G. Daly, who's an amazing voiceover artist and actress, and I, I told her I was doing this. She said, oh, I did a one woman show. And I said, why don't you still do it? You know, and she just kind of looked at me and said, that was a lot. That's a lot of work. <laughs> well, I heard you It's you would spend about eight to 10 hours for every two hour show between the setup, the the breakdown, because you, oh, you have to essentially load in and load out every performance. We had to, it was a two hour setup for the show, because uh, I had, I packed it full of magic as well as the, I, mean, I just the first 20 minutes of the 30 minutes of the show was just I, I wanted to come out and just hit it hard doing magic and then there's a left turn that happens in the show and we move into narrative uh that's my dancing nipple trick which um uh uh great was, yeah, Ella, Ella <laughs> yeah. It, it's a it's a way of doing um matrix with your nipples and of course and <laughs> of course the the great Mike Ella Zaldi, it's spectral motion made me the made me the chest it was really it's really funny but um, but it, we had to load out every night because the theater was in use every day. And I, so you can imagine not only did we load in, set two hours to set up the show. Sometimes we had two shows in a day. And then at midnight, I'd be tidying up the stage, which was a complete mess by the end of the show, pack it all the way into the back of the truck. And then the same the next day. It was exhausting, absolutely exhausting. Um, and it was me and Dan uh, most of the time. That was and just, I believe early on, the first person in was uh, Chris Philpot, right, on the script? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris Chris was the one who convinced me to do it. Well, See, let's double check with him. There's Chris Philpot. Yeah, I have his uh, oh, original, original draft. <laughs> hello, of, Steve. hello, hello. How you, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. How are you? How are the neighbors? <laughs> <laughs> we have the neighbors from hell. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> By the way, my dream version of the show, Chris then goes off camera and Billy Kid comes back into frame. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, Chris, Chris wrote a, a treatment for a one man show for me. And, and it was just, it was brilliant. And then it just inspired me. And I, I have a tendency to go off in my own directions. Um, if anyone is lucky enough to work with this man, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you'd be very lucky. He's a brilliant writer. And, um, like, there would be no one-man show without him. There'd be no show at all. Well, and also a huge thank you to Chris you. because uh, the articles he wrote about you in both Magic and Genie were uh, invaluable in doing the research. Um, <laughs> yes. <those are> fantastic. <laughs> Chris would uh, ask me all kinds of questions, and because we're friends, I would answer honestly, and then it all ended up in the article. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the well, way it works. You were working on uh, 40 Elephants at the time, this, yeah. you know, this uh, pilot we were writing and the series we were writing. And... Uh, you got some funding for the show. And I always tell magicians when I'm working with them, what do you do better than any other magician in the world? And I said, Steve, you're a freaking amazing actor. You know, you 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 can act better than any magician out there. And you can you can you should do some acting in the show. And not only that, I, I've seen some really boring shows with magicians just talking about themselves. But yeah. your life is actually really interesting. <laughs> and I, I was like pushing you in that direction. And that was like, I, I feel was like, like I, I was resisting it. So the writing much. is, you know, Steve's a fantastic writer. Steve's a fantastic writer. He just needs to, you know, hear some things that he, uh, you know, he knows intuitively. But I was just kind of like trying to encourage him. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it, it's so true. And, and uh, yeah, Chris was just like, you could do this and you could do this. You could start like this. You could have this scene where this happens. You could do, you know, and then it could all come back to this. And then you said you do the structure of uh, a movie structure so that you have your opening, you have your, you know, and then and then there's a twist, there's a turn, and then you go off on the journey. And then there's the, all this lost moments. I like structure. <laughs> you love structure. And, um, 
And then, then at the end, you bring it around and you have an emotional thing and then you come in and you, and you do the big finale. Um, and we should mention, yeah. by the way, the other, the, so, so the other reason we had the show and the main reason we had the show was I was very, I went on Kickstarter because I knew if we were going to do it, <laughs> then there's no way that I yeah, could run yeah. it. And we got an amazing response and we were able to raise the money to do the show. It wasn't easy because a live show, you, you, um, you don't have a, really a product to give people. So there's right. only so many things you can do, postcards, videos, um, and, and, but people were just so willing to give and donate and, and, uh, mm. uh, and this just an experiment in live theater um, and tickets, of course, to the show that uh, we could not have done it without them. And um, yeah, absolutely. I, I remember saying to Chris, if we get the money, we'll do the show. And then, <laughs> and then we got the money and I was like, Shit! Now I'm gonna do the show. <laughs> yeah, I heard you found out that Kickstarter doesn't give you the money unless you reach the full goal uh, until oh, wow. after you had started the Kickstarter. <laughs> no, actually, I knew that oh, because okay, I, that was my excuse to not do it. See, this is self sabotage, right? One on one. So I thought, okay, if I yeah. if I do it so that I have to reach this goal, I probably won't reach that goal, and then um, and then I might have to do it. <laughs> but if I did the other one, go fund me. You you get to keep whatever you whatever you raise, which doesn't make any, a lot of sense really, because if you've kind of thought that it's going to cost you this much to do the show, but you raise a third of it, then you, the people who are donating are like they're not really a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kickstarter is, is a lot of work in and of itself because um, not to plug a different one man show. What's that? You said it's his own thing in and of itself, and I said not to plug a different one. Yeah, that was a that was a great show too. Um, uh, yeah, but, uh, but it was just, I had a front row seat for the whole development of this because we we're working on Forty Elephants at the time. Yeah, and yeah. Steve's and Forty Steve's, Elephants was uh, who were who were they or what 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 was the Forty Elephants? You want to you want to say what that was? Uh, Steve, do you want to? <laughs> All right, so we did, we had an idea for a series and we pitched it to Lionsgate and they bought it and we sold it to TNT. And we were writing the pilot script at the time. And it was, it's about a gang, a British gang that actually existed in, and in well, I mean, like up for about 250 years altogether in London who were all women. Yeah. And it just seemed like the perfect uh, time to do a show like that. Um, we Would had you have been the lead. I have a picture of you potentially that would work i think you could that's be the, the reason the show didn't continue right there was because i'm i can do it i can play um you could, they could see gi you and Ted, you could be all of the 40. oh the sizzle reel was great so this is you were there for that weren't you chris uh for this the, um, i was I, yeah, yeah with my girls that's uh, hot in cleveland and you recognize the actress on yeah. there right uh, there are two actresses in this photo actually you need to be more specific <laughs> you recognize the blonde, <laughs> the natural blonde. Uh, anyway, By the way, speaking of natural blondes, uh, I, I do want to bring in one more surprise guest because there is more surprises. Oh uh, you've heard of Tim before. He's also part of the team that made Life and Other Deceptions happen. It's Chipper Lowell, everybody. Chipper! He's going to come in, I swear. There he is. <laughs> Chipper! Chipper! Hey! Hey, how are you guys? This is your life. Uh, the uh, you know, for someone who made yeah. it in the middle. Did did you um? By, the, you... by the way, the Billy the kid, Billy kid uh, thing. Watching you sweat. Oh my god! Oh, it was so, so damn funny. funny. <laughs> so damn funny. I do you know? I just didn't know what to do. I was like, this is <laughs> this is. I, I have a couple well, of you know, online. But, but we, We've all had that, you know, where you do a show and then you do meet and greet afterward and someone yeah. comes up and goes, hey, we're back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Remember us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> You're, what's my name? What's my name? Just tell me my name. You know my name. <laughs> and oh if somebody ever does that to me uh, and they said, I think you screwed up, I would respond. I don't screw up. Oh, you had that set ready to go. That was very good. Was very oh, good. I do. I have, if you ever, if, I have a couple of them. If anybody, if it gets too loud, I have this ready to go. Silence! <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's another one of those commercials. I love sandwich. Jesus. I, <laughs> oh, I used man. to get, when I used to go to these 
Playboy Mansion party. Long story. Just dropped that name. But I used to go to, and <laughs> literally, girls would come up to me and go, silence, and walk away. It was the strangest thing. It's not what you want to hear from a playmate. But there you go. Um, Chipper, do you remember when we were doing the show and we could only get the theater at 1130 at night? And you would drive down and we would rehearse. We, yeah, we, we would. Uh, yeah, they would they would finish something up at, at 11 or sometimes right up to 1130. We would we would uh, haul everything in 1130 and then work till about five, six, seven in the morning. Yeah, it was crazy. And yeah. thankfully, my wife, who's in show business, thank God, never once questioned. You know, you she just went, yeah, that's normal, you know. <laughs> you're getting yeah. in at seven in the morning. I, 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 I gotta go off. I, yeah, I gotta go off. Of like that's magic glitter. Let Steve's aftershave. I can smell on on. Uh, yeah. yeah. Do you know? I, I don't talk about this much, but the night before we opened, everything broke. Yeah. Do you remember? It was like the sound system didn't work because yeah. the yeah everything. Everything, everything broke. Uh, the sound system didn't work in the theater for some reason. We had to go get a new microphone kit, find a new microphone and everything. I had props. See, I wanted to do all this vintage magic and I found all this vintage magic. And the problem with vintage magic is it's old, right? And so it broke. I was doing the um, a Tommy Wonder effect and I think it was like three in the morning and I remember the gimmick snapped and a piece shot in the air and landed on the floorboards and went between the boards of the step no. Get to it. Yeah. And you know, talk about and, yeah. and Chipper was like, maybe we shouldn't open. Like it was like five in the morning. <laughs> and we were opening that night. And you remember, you were like, I don't know, maybe we should wait. And you can I'm like, no, I'll replace the trick. We've got to do it, we've got to open. Because we could not yeah. get a full run through without well, something breaking. But also ironically, you talk about yeah, there you know, are signs, you have to recognize the signs. Uh, in your life, no. Yeah, but sometimes you have to look at the signs, and you have to go like that, and you just have to go. Wait, this is fine yeah. for me. Because right? every sign was saying, "Don't do it." <laughs> every sign, every sign. It was the, it was the, uh, it was the, the Amityville horror of one man showed where the theater was saying, "Get out." Yeah, yeah. But here's here's the deal. Um, you know, uh, Billy touched upon it. I had been asked over the years, if I would direct or be part of other people's one man shows, you know, to either direct it or to pr produce it or things like that. And I was always very, very polite saying, Oh, I'm really busy. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really busy. And well, you are really the thing busy. Is with, yeah. 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 And the thing is with this one, uh, the, the script that uh, Chris and Steve had put together was, Great. Steve, Not Steve. only that, but same thing. Uh, Steve can uh, uh, Steve can act, and and I just did not want to deal with anything where it's a magician trying to trying to act. It's a magician. Trying, it's the same with comedians. They want to do a one man show, so they take their forty five minutes of material, spread it out over two hours. And it's, of course, it looks like you've spread two hours, you know, spread My material show is over two hours. Minutes, Chipper. It's only 90 minutes. I was agreeing on what just I mean, happened is a roller coaster ride of emotion. <laughs> but but it, it is, it's that thing. 99% of them are, are just like you want to shoot yourself in the head. And uh, here's the other thing when you're directing Steve, I can actually say steve actually take it down and we kind of want it like this and i'm and i'm talking shorthand and immediately steve goes got it and next time he's doing it it's exactly what steve, he wanted to get it's not me steve having is the best to someone oh thanks guys but then as soon as you left the theater i went back to my old way of doing it obviously <laughs> that's, that's what yeah. happened <laughs> no. But here's the, here's the well, other thing. I mean, as instance, one of the things about writing with Steve, being, you know, co-writing on the, the, the show, we, um, you know, he's like an idea fountain. You know, he's like, boom, 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 we could do this, we could do with this. And it's just like so many ideas. And I'm a little, I'm a little slower, you know, and I'm trying to think it through. And I'm like, uh, you know, and sometimes I think I actually told you, could you stop talking for just one minute? Many times. Because <laughs> you yeah. would have so many ideas. But if you, you know, the, 
often brilliant. Sometimes they were just okay. But if you told him, he was ne ego never got in the way, you know, which never. is so rare in the creative yeah. arts. He's just, you know, yeah, it's, it's just like really the greatest brilliant. collaboration. I believe, I, I believe in collaboration. I believe in you can't do it all. Yeah. And other people will often have see you not the way you see them, not the way you see yourself, yeah. that you need. And I think this is what's missing in magic, um, period. When you put an act together, yeah. you need a director. You need someone in the audience who can tell you oh, what we're yeah. doing. Right? Yeah. And when Chipper and I were working on stuff as well, and, and it was like two o'clock in the morning, and we'd be like, the transition doesn't work. Or maybe we need to stage it where you're up here and this is coming this way. Um, uh, you, you just have to, uh, maybe that's that's what just comes from being an actor for so long in TV, because in TV, you have to move. You don't have time to argue with the director. The director comes in and they're trying to do this. And you can do one or two things. Yeah. You can ignore him, in which case news travels and you're not gonna get as much work. Yeah. Or you can be flexible and go with it. And if it doesn't work, Usually the director will go, well, you know, let's try something else. And then you can do it the way you, you want to do it. Yeah. But thanks, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I loved was that, uh, and I, I, you know, it's, it's it's been, what, two years now since three? I don't know. Six, two thousand. long it's been. It? I think 16. I mean, it might be almost four years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, and then with, with, yeah, with other, uh, 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 putting it up. Um, but one of the coolest things was be able to, he's telling these stories and I would just go, this isn't working because you're an actor. Why aren't you be this guy? Remember? Yes. Or the, the, mm. the con man throwing the cigarettes so it was over the building. Show don't tell, right? It, we, there was a lot of yeah. show don't, which is in writing as well. You know, in writing, you, you want to show. Yeah. You don't yeah. want to keep telling. And that was the thing I'd written it with a lot of like, and then this happened and this happened. And then Chipper would say, well, can't and you? And I was like, no, no, no. Be the that. guy. Yeah. <laughs> Be the guy. I would yeah. never say that to any other magician. <laughs> but, you know, but for an actor, oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, we created Be the character, the guy. The, the guy from Yugoslavia, Andro, who was my kind of, the bartender who got me into so much trouble over the two years I was in Yugoslavia. Like we created him because I would talk about him, but it's like, well, let's see him, let's meet him, you know? And uh, that became yeah. a lot of fun to kind of produce that person. You're seeing with the landlord. You're seeing oh, with the landlord was all acted. He told it here, but, but it was totally acted out. It was great. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Norris, with the, the Norris with the cigarette. and, just the, and right. yeah. It's interesting, you know, when you get in front of an audience, <laughs> You 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 don't know what's going to work. The the I think one of the biggest laughs in the show was I did we I don't think we knew this was going to happen. But there's a moment when it's a very serious moment, and I'm telling them about the worst gig. One of the worst. One of the main reasons I quit Magic also was I was getting more and more. I was doing gigs for celebrities, and you don't when you want to be an actor, you don't want to do celebrity gigs. You want to be the celebrity. And I didn't. I did a birthday party for a famous celebrity, and the audience. The entire audience were all A-listers, studio exec, and they. I was excited to do the show, and they ignored me. The entire show. It was like I wasn't there. Uh, he wasn't there though. That's. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it was the show or not, but I was like, maybe it is. <laughs> no, that wasn't the show. That's just. Uh, that's that's a long story. Um, but no, I, and there's a line in the show where I just say, do you know? I look at. What we discovered was if, when you talk about yourself, it's very self-centered, but when you ask the audience if they've ever felt that way, you open the door for pathos and empathy. And so I would mm. say to the audience, have you, ever, have you ever been ignored? And I could see everyone in the audience nodding their heads. Everyone has been ignored at some point in their life. And it, there was just this moment, but then I, I don't, do, I can't remember if this was written or if this happened organically, but I was like, Instead of you ever been ignored, hello, <laughs> you know, and it was this moment where, yeah, did it happen organically? I forget. Yeah, we no, we changed it. We we because the again, it was one of those ideas of can the audience be this audience at this particular uh, right, you know, party? Can the audience yeah, play. We're, we're so during the thing. There's times when the audience realizes, oh, they're playing the role of this particular, and they're you know, doing whether exactly it's the castle right. audience. I'm complaining. Yeah. So it ended up yeah. being the biggest laugh in the show because I'm like, hello, you know, yeah. like, you're not responding. You're ignoring me. It was, a big, it was a big laugh. But when that scene finishes, um, I've 
I've seen several times where you got standing ovations in the middle of the show. From the because it was so strong. The cards, the angry cards, Dad. After yeah. you do the yeah, yeah, yep. that was such an oh, honest, beautiful emotion. The, for the for it the viewers, beautifully just the, right thank up. you. The idea was to talk about the worst gig ever and how you feel as an artist on stage when the audience is mistreating you and it's loud and it's noisy and no one's paying attention and you're just like, what's the point? You know, we've all been there. We've all, what's the point? And I'm in the middle of a card stab yeah. and I'm blindfolded and I can hear everybody. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking these things that apparently I find out I'm saying out loud about like, you know, like, you know, is this, is this never gonna be enough? What's the point? And then it's the end of it, at the end of this monologue, it's just like, as you stab the knives down, it's just like, what's the point? And it's so, and I remember the first night I did it, like I didn't know, because the show makes a left turn. People aren't expecting it. You know, there's real right. emotion. Is, it was- As uh, it should be. As it should be, yeah, yeah. And it was it was really yeah. fun to do. Really fun yeah, to it's not, my thought off and see people's faces. It, the beauty of the show is that it's not a show where an audience is watching it passively. So I, you know, I would watch it from the back and during those moments, you saw them leaning in, you saw them, you know, reacting. I mean, really, you, you could, you could see the show working. It wasn't a, you know, oh, we're all watching television. Um, but again, yeah. this is, this is a show that happens to have magic in it. You could take the magic out of it and still the story is told fully. And that was the key to me wanting to be part of this. I didn't want it to be a, let's find a ridiculous reason to get to the next trick. Right. You know, which is every mm -hmm. one man show that is trying to be theatrical versus a magic show. You know, there's great magic shows. There's great solo magic shows. Um, but this was not supposed to be a magic show. This is supposed to be an actual play, uh, an actual one man, you know, uh, you know, it's yeah. I, I, uh, really working honest. with Steve was just was what? I said a brutally honest journey, and then I was, <laughs> working it, with Steve was just and it was so yeah. <laughs> it had to, <laughs> yeah it, it it had to be and you know and I warned Steve I said you know just so you know I'm really brutally honest not in a mean way I'm just I just get really honest with what works what doesn't work there's no emotion behind it. If something doesn't work, what can we replace it with? Is it still not working? Does it need to be in there? You know, it's almost like every single piece within the play almost has to audition to continue to be in the play. Yeah. You know, but I because also think that it, I, really that learned, I really learned from you the uh, stock line rule. Like, there were so many times, I was like, but it's a funny line. And you'd be like, Everyone does it. No, but I, but I changed it a little bit. And you'd be like, no, find something better. I believe every time you tried to use a stock line, the first reaction was. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And it worked, you know, it worked. It's like getting rid of your favorite routines. You, 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 you find either, you, you find something to fill it. And that's the oh, I, I strongly encourage that. My lecture URL terrible is all about throwing all of those lines out and, uh, I recently yeah, said in an online version, yeah. this is a really good time to go through your script and just chuck every stock line and rewrite it because you have some time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a shout out, by the way, to the great Peter Samuelson, who said this is a great insight to the process behind creating such an amazing show. Hi, and Peter. Uh, Peter so knows drama, so thank you, Peter. I appreciate that. Uh, and so there's a question, uh, and I think a lot of people are, are people are asking about rebooting the show and being able to see the show. Uh, and Todd Gerard said, what was the most valuable thing you learned from your one man show? Um, as we get into uh, stoppage time, if you want to send your questions in, um, we're about to go into the final piece of the show where you get to ask uh, as many questions as we can okay. in, a, in a short period of time. Um, right. But while we still have Chris and Chipper, uh, let's start with uh, Chipper. Uh, what was the most valuable thing you learned from uh, this one man show experience? And then we'll go to Chris and then to Steve. Uh, well, I mean, it, to me, anything involved in something like this is learning. I, it's the whole thing. It's the whole thing. I think it's the reason why Steve likes to take these types of projects on. It's for the same reason I like to take these types of projects on. And I think Chris probably feels exactly the same way. The process itself mm -hmm. is the key, is the thing to experience, to go from point A to point B, to C, D, all the way through. Um, I won't take that journey with people I don't trust. 
And that's what was completely different from any other thing where I said, yeah, this is, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. And even if it's not great, the, 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 the journey itself will be great, you know, yeah. but I knew, I knew already it was no brainer. I don't have to teach Steve how to act. I don't have to teach Steve on, and, 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 and Chris, like, you know, it, write a good script, you know, it's, so as it went along, it was, it was a wonderful collaborative uh, affair all the way through it. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you can miss with uh, the great beard Dini. I think that's a, it's an ace up your sleeve right there. Uh, Chris, what did I you, think you are the great Beardini now, my friend. <laughs> that's right. There we go. <laughs> Coming in. Uh, Chris, what we was had, that? We <laughs> had a script. Oh, sorry. We, oh, I was just going to say, but, but, you know, the other thing too, I, I is we had a script that was so huge that we were constantly editing, 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 editing it yeah. just to get down to where it was at. And even then it's a long show. But we were like, okay, we're right at the breaking point. At least if we can keep it within an hour, first half, hour, second half. It was about two and a half hours in the end, wasn't it? And we had, I remember a friend of my wife's came, who's a director. And he was just like, this is going to be awful. And, you know, he was rolling his eyes. There's no way this is going to work. And um, after the show, he was like, I didn't believe you could pull it off. You pulled it off. And that was like one of the biggest compliments, you know, because he just expected it not to work. <laughs> but thank you yeah. yeah and chris do you have a quick lesson that you can share with everybody on, on what you picked up from this process i'm sure there's a lot of lessons but um, oh yeah of course there's a lot of lessons i mean the um i think it you know i'm going to echo what chipper said you know choose your collaborators really well um steve and i how long was it we said i want to write with you you know, we want to do a, we wanted to collaborate on a screenplay and we were throwing ideas around sometimes 10 a night saying we could do a show about this. We could do a show about this and yeah. back and forth. All we knew was we wanted to work together. Yes. We didn't have an idea. It wasn't about the idea. It was just about, we knew we would work well together. Just yeah. We met at a, we met and at a finally meeting. we, uh, right. sorry, Chris, go ahead. I said we met at the elders and we found no, out no, no, we go ahead. a ton of series, yes. a, a ton of similar projects, and that was kind of how it all began. Yes, yeah, I was hired to write uh, the, the John Mulholland magician at the CIA project, and you were working on a similar project at the same time. And yeah. we both just released book yeah. tests, and yeah. I'd written a pilot yeah. about magic. And I'm going. Who are the magician actors out there? Steve Valentine. Oh, it'd be nice to meet him. Then I see you at this 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 meeting. I'm going. I want to meet him before the end of the thing. And we just hit it off like that. Yeah. Anyway, let's go for lunch. Let's try. You know. Right. And sometimes you just meet someone, and you don't. You just have to pursue that that uh, friendship and that collaboration, even though you have no idea where it's going to go. Yeah. Uh, well, Chipper and Chris, thank you so much for joining us. You can follow Chipper on Twitter and Instagram at Chipper Lowell. Uh, Chris Philpott has a ton of great magic products in the market, including uh, 100th Monkey. I actually will tell you, I spent $75 on Pantheon, uh, a great book about uh, application of the 100th Monkey Bridge. Thank home, you. Only to find out that I was in the book. <laughs> Class. I, I gave you a shout out, Jack. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it was well worth it. Um, Brilliant. Uh, but thank you so much, guys, for joining yes, us. Yes, you guys. Well, you know, I, I did on. not put your routine in. I told everyone to look it up. Thank you. No, I appreciate <laughs> thank it you. very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you it's so, so much. great to see you, Steve. We're going to chat. We'll Love chat. You. Bye. you guys soon. Thank you. All right, we are almost done. Uh, make sure you follow Steve Valentine, at Steve Valentine. Um, we have time for very rapid fire questions, uh, maybe only two or three minutes. Um, so uh, these are gonna be quick answers to quick questions. Uh, Steve Valentine from Peter Samuelson, how long was the development process? Uh, it wasn't, uh, the development process was, uh, I, it took me about three months to, to write the show. And then um, it, we only had about six weeks to put it on its feet that was it so it wasn't long it wasn't long it was really really intense perfect uh gerard asks are you thinking about getting back into the performance scene uh, are you going first or going to see what happens this actually a bunch of people have asked this question which is when are you going to be uh performing again 
And uh, what, yeah. uh, do you have any plans uh, for that? I mean, I got a chance to tour with the Illusionists over the Christmas holidays, and that was amazing to, to get on stage in front of 5,000 people. And the plan is to bring um, a version of Life and Other Deceptions to the theater whenever theater decides to come back to life. Um, I was kind of working on that before before the quarantine. So I do definitely do want to bring that show back. It's it's tr it's tricky just kind of timing it with um uh I, with the the writing stuff that I'm doing and then Magic on the Go which is my my online school of magic and then thank you Erica. She loved the show. Thank you Erica. I love you. Um and um you know so I've got Magic on the Go and I've got the acting. So sometimes it's tough to kind of like lock that portion of time away, but I'm always performing or writing or getting to to work on the on the project so my, my goal is definitely to bring that to to a theater and let's talk briefly about magic on the go because that is an incredible deal that's been running for three years now yes we started it in 2017 it's i think we've got over 500 videos on there now and the goal is to create a, a like a I, I really want to create the largest database of magic online. That's my goal. The idea is so no matter where you are, you can look up a product or a type of trick and you can pull it up and learn it. So it works on the phone, on the iPad um, as a subscription service. We've got 500, over 500 videos and it's, it's a way of, uh, and, I, and it's all me. It's to me, it's two things. One is uh, a mentors, mentors are so important in magic. Um, that when you learn one-on-one -on -one with someone, it meant so much to me when I was younger. Uh, so I, I film these these videos like I'm talking to you. So it's just like we're learning together. So that's why I do all the videos. I had a couple of guests come on and do stuff, but I've done all the videos. And um, and so the idea is that the, the, the proliferation of one-trick DVDs is, has been so huge that we're losing the secrets of magic right we they're in the books they're in the pamphlets that were published long long ago and so for me i want to keep these secrets alive so what i've been doing and this all started during the card to pocket thing c2p is i'll find something and i'm like this is a great trick this is a great principle like we i can't put it out on a dvd that's not you know what do you do with it so the subscription service enables me to upload stuff whenever i want and to work on routines and do deep dives into topics like diminishing cards or cards across. Or um, right now, I'm doing one on suspensions. You know, like uh, the the jar of rice on the sword on the sword, or things sticking to the hands. And because I think those are really powerful effects. And just kind of elaborate on things in a way that uh, you can't do in any other format. So that's kind of the idea of it. No, it's amazing. And uh, one more time, it's magiconthego.com. That's yes. pretty easy to remember. There, you can subscribe by month. You subscri subscribe by year. Uh, yeah. And C2P, which I think is $200, is available all on Magic on the Go. Yeah. it's, all, it's all uh, Seven it's, DVDs, 22 hours worth. 90% of that is on there already, as is Cloth. Booked will be on there soon, three. And then all the other stuff that I've, that I've, uh, that I've filmed as well. So it's, yeah, it's not a bad deal. I think it was, a, it, the whole point is, is to make the Magic available to people who want to learn. And and there's also history and, and that nods to the, the names of the past, these these shoulders that we that we of giants that we stand on as magicians, we shouldn't forget who they are. And uh, just keep them just keep that that magic alive. And so it's not expensive. You know, I priced it so that uh, you can it's like 10 bucks a month, but you you can um, learn so much but also just kind of so even if it's stuff you're not going to do you kind of soak in the methods and then something will come back out that you can use later down the road well i love that and doing a lot of the research uh one of the things one of the trends that keeps kept coming up is your incredible knowledge of old school magic old school magic books and magazines um and you had a quote about uh sometimes if you can't move forward you have to look backwards when it, when it comes to coming up with new magic sometimes the really old gems are things that are have been forgotten, but are still really, really good tricks that can be uh, done in the in the present. And you can adapt it, just a slight adaptation, and you've got something new, you know. And and the problem with doing a lot of research is often you'll come up with an idea, and then you discover somebody, uh, somebody printed it in the magic wand in 1923. <laughs> you know, now I've got to give credit to this person, <laughs> but you know they did. Like someone like Fred Culpit, who was known as a comedy magician who created the Doll's House illusion had so many original ideas and doesn't get the credit for them. Um, Edward Victor, another guy from, from England who was a manipulator, just way ahead of his time, you know? I saw there's a move that I got from the magic wand, a card to pocket move, 
that was is just so brilliant way of showing your hand empty before you pull the card out of the pocket and uh and then and some and there was a young guy who published it uh, clearly came up with it slightly different but came up with it independently um on the, uh, sold the video you know and i was like that's in like an old magic wand right. <laughs> just these things are around and listen these guys from back in the day they were doing when they were working they were doing eight shows a day in vaudeville an old time music call they would do tricks that worked they this was uh, they would do magic for audiences that were incredibly sophisticated in their knowledge of variety acts. So if it didn't work, the audience would let the performer know. So these these are these are magicians of the past are really worth studying what they did and how they did it. Well, I, this this has been uh, incredible. Uh, there are people literally from all over the world watching in who have been thanking you for taking part in this. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, the last question I always ask every guest is because okay. there are young performers and young entertainers who are watching this. What advice would you give to them as they consider their career in magic, uh, acting or entertainment? Uh, don't give up because uh, I saw, I know that sounds a bit cheesy, but you know what? Sometimes uh, the best things in life are cheesy. I think um, one of the things I saw in LA, it took me three years to get my first line in a show, which was Married with Children. I had like one line. and. I and think then, you were immediately murdered after that line too, right? I got hit by a car. <laughs> I, yes, I say, I say Meryl Street naked, no bloody way, and then I get hit by a car. And um, welcome to uh, show business. Yeah, right. That was it. That was the end of my career. <laughs> I, I, it took three years, right? And less, and I was doing classes and all this other stuff. And I would meet people over the course of the time that I lived in LA. Who, oh, I'm gonna, uh, I'm in top of my drama class, and so I'm gonna go to LA and become a star. And then they give it a year. You can't give it a year. You you have to give it. You, Till it happens, you, you just can't give it a year, and um, and so that's what I mean by you have to have a quiet belief that this is right for you and who you are and what and that this is what you're meant to do. Doesn't mean that at some point you don't look in the mirror and go, you know what, well, maybe this isn't right for me. You'll know it, you'll feel it inside, but you have to give it time because the people that you meet along the way. You, you may bump into those people 10 years from now and that, that person's going to be integral. I would say get the Michael Caine biography, autobiography. It's called From Elephant to Hollywood, From the Elephant to Hollywood, and get the audio book because the way he reads it is just beautiful. <laughs> it's like he's talking to you. His whole book is about, I met this guy when I was doing, I was going to do Oliver in London, everyone else, you know, Sean Connery got James Bond, Terence Stamp had become a big star. They were all roommates. He's like, I wasn't gonna make it. And I met this guy then, and I met this guy. And then 20 years from there, I meet him again. He's like, you wanna play this part? You know, and you look at his life and you see all the threads. It's all about building threads and just creating the tapestry that later on you, you'll, you know, it's like a spider's web, right? At some point, all those little threads are gonna connect. So just don't give, up. I love that. Steve, thank you so, so much for joining. Uh, again, you can follow him at Steve Valentine on Twitter and on Instagram. You can subscribe to magiconthego.com uh, monthly or yearly. It's a great resource. So definitely check that out at magiconthego.com. Steve, you. thank you so much again for joining. Uh, stay safe and stay well. And uh, I hope our paths cross soon. Uh, me too. Thank you, Harrison. That was a blast. Take uh, care. Bye-bye. So Steve Valentine, everybody. Unbelievable. He, uh, what an incredible guest. A huge thank you uh, to Steve and as well to our surprise guest, Billy Kidd, our uh, fake out mystery guest, Lindsay, uh, Jipper Lowell, and Chris Milpot. Uh, just a huge thank you to Alexander for his support throughout his tenure as president of the IBM. A huge congratulations uh, to Stephen Bergazzi. If you'd like to join the IBM, International Brotherhood of Magicians, you just go to magician.org slash join dash the dash IBM slash join. You can sign up for a new membership. You can renew your membership. You get copies of the Lincoln Ring, which is an incredible publication. Um, so make sure you do that uh, and support uh, really one of the best magic organizations in the world. Uh, and you can tune into this show every Wednesday at 7 p.m. if you're on the East Coast, 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, we have a great guest next week, I swear to you. That is on uh, Wizard's Honor. Wizard's Honor. And uh, I can't wait to see you next week, next Wednesday, same time, same place, whobooksnet.com. Thanks so much again for joining. My name is Harrison Greenbaum. You can catch me at Harrison Comedy. Good night. Uh, stay safe and stay well, and we'll see you next week. Who put that with Harrison Greenbaum? I'm singing the song I always sing. It's presented by IBM.